It's time to introduce our next speaker, a consultant ophthalmologist at Mid and South Essex NHS Trust, Mr. Aman Chandra, has a specialist interest in retinal diseases and vitreo retinal surgery, and he's further interested in connective tissue conditions affecting the eye, particularly Marfan syndrome. Another niche of his is ophthalmic genetics. And most importantly, Mr. Aman Chandra is an invaluable advisor to our trust. Welcome, Aman. Can I just say firstly, that was an incredible talk prior to, to, to me and Romain and his, your, your wife, so I forgot your name. That's incredible work you've done um, stemmed from a personal story. I, I think it's really admirable and a real asset to the, the Marfan community. So thank you for that. Thanks for, guys for inviting me again to talk to the Marfan Trust. As Victoria said, I'm, I'm an ophthalmologist uh, uh, and the clinical director of ophthalmology in Essex in mid and south Essex a South End Hospital primarily and Anglia Ruskin University. For some of you who may not know where um, South End is, it's in, at the bottom right of England. Um, I've circled the three hospitals we work at in Basildon, in South End and Chelmsford um, in Essex. Um, we cover about 1.2 million people. Um, I, I'm briefly just, you know, I always re recall when I'm talking about Marfan, is Antoine Marfan on, on the left, who... Um, who first spotted this child Gabriel with with uh, very striking skeletal features? Um, um, after him, the condition has been named that we're talking about today. Um, so, um, why have I got an interest in this condition? Well, uh, many years ago, with Jose and Anne and a few others who are so Anne and Jose who are on this meeting today and a few others, I, I did a PhD looking at the genetics of ectopia lentis, and from then stemmed my interest in Marfan syndrome and some other conditions. And we published over 15 papers so far. And that book from Anne, um, I was fortunate enough to, to write a chapter on the ophthalmic abnormalities of Marfan. And as a result, I've been, a, a, I've been privileged to be a medical advisor to this trust for over 10 years. So I've got a particular interest in this condition, mainly from that stemming from that research, but also my interactions with patients with the condition has been always very rewarding. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the eye and Marfan syndrome. That's what I'm going to, to dwell on. And then just briefly touch on some of the work that Anne, Jose and I have done in the past. Um, I'm going to dwell on different parts of the eye um, and therefore different conditions of the eye that are manifest in Marfan. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how common retinal detachments are in Marfan and some other um, genetic work that we did it a while ago. And then answer some questions that I often get posed by patients with Marfan syndrome who come to see me. This is a picture of the eye. Can you see my mouse as well? Do you see that moving? Yes. I hope so. If we can. Jolly good. So that's the eye. And um, this is sliced in, in half. So that's the front of the eye called the cornea. And in, in, in red boxes is every part of the eye that has fibrillin in it. And as you know, fibrillin one is, is the, is the protein that's affected primarily by, by, uh, mutations in the gene fibrin 1 and therefore affected by in Marfan syndrome. So the cornea is at the front of the eye, the window of the eye, the bit that you would put a contact lens on, the bit of the front of the eye that you can touch. And the white bit of the eye is called the sclera. Behind the cornea, you have the blue, well, in this eye, blue, called the iris. In my eye, brown. Behind the iris is the lens. Um, the white bit is also covered by a sort of skin in the eye called conjunctiva. And at the back of the eye, if you go inside the eye, 80% of the eyeball is full of this, this jelly-like substance called vitreous. And at the very back of the eye, you have the, the retina, which is in this eye, red. And the nerve at the back of the eye, which takes the messages from the retina to the brain backwards. Um, and then the very central part of the retina is called the macula. And that's important for detailed vision. So this is a picture of the eye. And as you can see, fibrillin is present in almost every part of it. And it's therefore unsurprising that uh, mutations in the gene fibrin 1, which lead to problems in the protein fibrin 1, can cause trouble in the eye. I'm going to dwell on these bits in particular. Um, and I'll start at the very front. So the cornea, which is the, the very front of the eye, the bit that you can touch, the, the bit that you can put a contact lens on. So, um, in Marfan syndrome, or oh, sorry, in normal corneas, 
fibrillin 1 is present at the very front of the cornea um, rather than 80% of the cornea. So if you take that cornea, if you slice it in half, um, fibrillin 1 is found in the very front of it. It's a little bit surprising, therefore, that such a small part of the cornea can affect the overall shape of the cornea. And what happens in Marfan syndrome, and you'll see throughout my presentation, I've, I've, I've um, acronymed Marfan syndrome as F MFS. So if you see this, I'm referring to Marfan syndrome. And people with, with uh, Marfan syndrome have flatter and thinner corneas than the normal population. So it's normally a curve, and in Marfan syndrome, it's slightly flatter and much thinner. Um, so much, it's so characteristic, this feature, that some have suggested that the corneal features should be a diagnostic criteria. Um, I think that has pluses and minuses, that, that, that suggestion. The pros are, I think it is quite characteristic and it can be therefore used in a diagnostic way. The negatives are you need very specialized instruments to um, assess this feature, which isn't available everywhere, certainly not at optometrists and in many parts of the world, not, not available to most of the population. So th th there are problems with that suggestion. But because their cornea is flatter and thinner, I'd, I'd recommend not considering laser corrective surgery. So this is surgery that one might have to um, people have you know, in high streets and everywhere <clears throat> so that they can not wear glasses anymore. What happens in that laser is the, is the laser is applied to the very front of the cornea, uh, very front of the eye, to this cornea. And it changes the shape of the cornea, usually flattening it. If patients with Marfan syndrome already come with thinner and flatter corneas, lasering that bit um, is not to be recommended because it's already flatter and thinner than, than many other people um, and slightly dis, uh, disrupted. So as a general rule, we'd recommend not considering laser corrective surgery um, if you have Marfan syndrome. Uh, I'll move on now to the vitreous. So the vitreous is the gel inside the eye. So if you slice your eye apart, the inside, which is about 80%, is full of a clear gel called vitreous, which when you're born is like, um, is like an egg yolk. No, an egg white, sorry. Um, and if you ever got to 150, it, in everyone, it'll be a puddle. And so it it, it, it changes constituent, um, consistency as one ages. And I've got here a picture of the eye slice apart. So this inside of the eye is full of this vitreous gel. And it's the changes in the vitreous gel that lead to occasionally a tear in the retina, which is what I've I'm moved my mouse over. And that can then lead to what's called a retinal detachment where the retina, which should normally be adherent to the inside of the eye, can become detached. And the the, eye, the um, association between retinal detachment with Marfan syndrome and retinal detachment has been known for decades. Um, and it's primarily, I think, due to the changes in the fibrillin structure of the gel inside the eye, the vitreous. I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment. Uh, sorry, in, later on in the talk in our investigations and how common this is. <clears throat> I'll move on to the most most diagnostic feature, which is um, problems in the lens position because of this condition. <clears throat> so ectopia lentis means, um, ectopia comes from the Latin word, which means out of position. Um, and in many parts of medicine, that phrase is that word is used to mean out of its normal location, and lentis meaning of the lens. So it's an <clears throat> abnormally positioned lens. Excuse me, I'll just have a drink. <clears throat> the reason that is is because the lens, it's a bit like a trampoline, is held in position by these things called zonules, which are like the springs of a uh, of a of a trampoline. And this I put in red box. Remember, I said that anything in a red box is, prime, is is where fibrillin is. So although I've said the lens is, um, has got fibrillin one, it's actually the zonules, the, the 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 springs of the trampoline, that are almost exclusively made of fibrillin one. Um, and if therefore you have problems in fibrillin one, these zonules are highly sensitive to being malfunctioning, 
And as a result, you might imagine, therefore, with the trampoline, if some of these springs were, were deficient or missing, the trampoline would be would be shifted out of place. And in, if you look at a normal eye, you shouldn't be able to see the edge of the lens. The, the most common cause of having uh, an out of position lens is Marfan syndrome. And it is one of the major diagnostic criteria for this condition. I've got a picture here. So this is again, this is the lens, which is now shifted down at the bottom. And you might be able to see these um, string-like features, which are the auxiliary zonules that I've mentioned before, which normally you shouldn't be able to see um, looking through the pupil of a patient's eye. Um, and certain mutations in fibrillin 1 uh, lead to, uh, are more prone to resulting in this zonular deficiency. And people with Marfan syndrome can become symptomatic at any age. Certain mutations are more likely to affect people at a younger age, but they can become symptomatic at any age. And if patients have got symptoms, which is usually which is visual symptoms, surgery may be an option. Um, when and if we do surgery on the lens, the most common question is, what do we do to replace removing that lens? And you can put a, you can replace it in numerous ways you can simply wear a contact lens so if we take this lens out of the eye they are going patients are going to need a substitute lens and this can simply be a contact lens and i always recommend people to consider this um, they don't have to be removed every day they can be removed <coughs> much less frequently than than every day um, and of course it means it, it's a pretty safe thing you can it's not another operation to put a lens in if you can't handle a contact lens, we can have a, an eye. So this is a cross section of the eye, the front of the eye. So this is the lens, this is the iris, the blue part, and this is the cornea, which is the bit that we can touch. So if we don't put a contact lens, we have to. Put, we can put a lens inside the eye. We can put it on the front of the eye. Sorry, on the front of the iris, and this is a lens in the anterior chamber. The anterior chamber is this front bit of the eye in front of the iris. We can put a lens attached to the iris. So, um, so clipped into the iris. If we put a lens in a more normal position, we could put it in the capsule. This is very difficult because this the capsule that holds the lens in place is often compromised because these zonules, as I mentioned before, are deficient. So this capsule, this lens will be over here. So it, it, it can be difficult to put a lens in this position and then somehow stitch the capsule to the front, to the to the eye again. Or we can put a lens fixed to the sclera or sutured to the sclera. The sclera is the white bit of the eye. So there's numerous options for replacing the lens that we might have to remove. Um, and there's no definitive evidence of which has a better outcome, in part because Marfan syndrome is, is, is moderately rare um, and there's never been any studies. It's all work that's been retrospectively done um, on, um, on cohorts of patients um, so therefore it is really surgeon specific and patient specific. Please interrupt me if you've got any questions or, or we can talk about questions at the end. Um, finally, I'll move on to the white bit of the eye, the sclera. So the sclera is the, like the outer coating of the eye and that has fibrin one. And if you have deficiency in fibrin one, um, like other parts of the body that are affected by fibrillin 1 mutations, you tend to get a deficiency in the structure. And, you know, with the skeletal features, patients tend to have long arms and very tall. In a similar feature, you might imagine that instead of being a certain shape, the, the, the eye is prone to becoming longer because the coat of the eye, the sclera, is, is affected by fibrillin 1 mutations. So if the eyeball is therefore stretched, this leads to what's known as short-sightedness or myopia. So if I show you here, this is a picture of a tennis ball and the eye focuses the image onto the retina here. That's the normal eye. If your eye is then a longer shape or size, that image no longer focuses on the retina. In fact, indeed, it focuses in front of the retina. And this is what is called short-sightedness. Um, and you might, you will therefore need a pair of glasses to change where that focal point is and it is the most common eye problem in Marfan syndrome and that is because as I said the coat of the eye 
it, the sclera is affected by fibrin 1 mutations, thus leading to the eye becoming longer, not much like the skeletal aspects, much like the, the um, aortic aspects. It could, it's more lax. Um, however, as many of you know, being short-sighted isn't the exclusive realm of patients with Marfan syndrome. It is pretty common across the world and ever-increasing so much so that people are talking about it in pandemic terms across the world. In Singapore, 97% of university students are myopic. And I promise you 97% of university students in Singapore have not got Marfan syndrome. So it's it's actually just an increasing problem throughout the world. And although it is recognized, it is thought to be a diagnostic, a minor diagnostic criteria for Marfan syndrome, I certainly do not believe it should be. And I've tried to make that point to, to uh, numerous times because it's so common. It really, you know, I don't think it has any specific, um, any specificity in helping diagnose Marfan syndrome. It's like saying, having a left foot, you know, it's so common for certain parts of the world. So I have talked about the eye in Marfan syndrome, and um, I'm happy to take any questions about that. I'll, I'll dwell now just briefly on some of the work that Jose, Anne, and myself have done in the past. Um, retinal attachments is it, and ectopia lentis are the main things that can cause vision loss in, in, in Marfan syndrome. So many years ago, we, we surveyed um, 181 patients with Marfan syndrome, um, and we found that almost a third of patients had had ectopia lentis, so dislocation of the lens. And the majority, 77%, were affected in both eyes. And 14% had had retinal detachments, of which 44% were affected in both eyes. Now, to put that in perspective with regard to retinal detachments, retinal detachments can happen and mostly happens in the normal population. Most patients with retinal detachments, which consistent, which pretty much make up most of my day-to-day -day work, they have not got Marfan syndrome. But in the population, it probably affects one in... 10,000 people. So it is seemingly higher in patients with Marfan syndrome. However, in the normal population, only up to 10% of people who have detached retinas in one eye will be affected in both eyes. So if a, a patient without Marfan syndrome has a detached retina, only 10% will be affected eventually in both eyes. Whereas in Marfan syndrome, it appears almost half of patients who have detached retina in one eye may go on to developing it in the other eye. We then did a prospective review um, of patients in the UK. So we, we sent questionnaires to every ophthalmologist in the country for a year, asking them if they could report to us whether they had had a patient with retinal detachment who also had Marfan syndrome. And during that year, we only identified eight cases um, in the UK. Um, and so although... Ectopia lentis is common, perhaps retinal attachment may not be as common as we believed, but if they are affected, patients who are affected by this, it may be more severe than in most patients with retinal attachment. I hope that's that, that's a lot of information and it may be a little bit wordy, but ask me any questions afterwards and I'll, I'll happily um, uh, try and re-explain that. So I'm, I'll talk on um, just briefly on some of the work we did many years ago. So dislocated lenses or ectopia lentis. Um, we've talked briefly about Marfan syndrome, uh, briefly entirely about Marfan syndrome, which is here on the left of this diagram. And they have mutations in fibrin 1. You can get some patients who aren't yet fully diagnosed with, with Marfan who have a dislocated lens or ectopia lentis who also have a fibrin 1 mutation. We, we put them in this bracket over here on, on the left. However, those, there are patients who have dislocated lenses who have mutations in another gene called ADAMTSR4 who have no problems in their fibrin 1. Um, and we compared these two groups a long time ago now. And essentially, we found that patients with Marfan syndrome had less severe ectopia lentis. So their, their dislocated lenses were less bad than those patients who had isolated ectopia lentis. But of course, patients with Marfan syndrome would and often may usually do have problems with their skeletal with their their their, their height and their arm width and and their heart. Whereas of course those patients with this condition called isolated ectopia lentis have no other problems because the name, as the name suggests, they just have problems with the eye. But these patients had worse eyes than those patients with Marfan syndrome. 
Um, I'm not going to show these videos unless you want me to, so I'll skip on about doing surgery um, for that condition of ectopia lentis. If you want me to show the videos, Victoria, then I'll show them later. Um, but these are questions that I often get asked by my patients. The patients do come to see me from um, across the UK, um, and I, I've had the privilege of dealing with, with a number of patients over, over the last um, almost decade. And these are questions I get asked. Laser corrective surgery. As I said, patients are often short-sighted, and many short-sighted people go ahead and have laser corrective surgery. Um, they ask me if, that, if, if I have Marfan syndrome, can I, should I, can I have laser corrective surgery? And the answer generally is no. Um, where do if you're going to remove my lens where would you put an artificial lens and as i said earlier on contact lenses are the best because it's non-surgical it's reversible you can take them out you can change them it, but for many people that may not be suitable for many people with problems with their fingers they may have difficulty putting them in and some people want a more permanent solution but the answer to the question of where can we surgically put a lens in is there's many options and um, i will discuss each option um, with each patient but there's no simple answer contact sports for the eyes on the whole it's okay for the eyes but if patients have problems with their lens then they need to have that discussion with their doctor um, there's no evidence potentially that um, any particular sport is, is less like more likely to cause problem but if their lens is already wobbly then that discussion needs to have, be had um, because many patients with Marfan syndrome may not have um, deficient zonules and how about children? Should they have surgery for ectopia lenses? Well, they need to be seen by an ophthalmologist. Um, and if their lens is sub, is in, a, in an unusual place and it's affecting their vision, then, then they probably would benefit from surgery, particularly if they're young children, because there is an impact on their visual development. Um, Jose and I and, and a colleague of mine recently wrote up um, um, a, a sort of a summary of Marfan syndrome from diagnosis to management and there is a plain language summary there for, for non-medical people and, and I'm happy to share this um, PDF with Victoria and others if they want at this stage um, that's the end of my talk I hope it was useful and I'm very happy to um, ask answer any questions that anyone might have about this questions have been arriving actually. oh sorry i've not seen them i will try no, not at all no um firstly mariam's had raised her hand for quite some time really patiently okay um good morning good morning dr chandra um morning. thank you first of all i want to say um my son is one of those um, rare specialist patients which you actually did a surgical eye surgery on him Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, this is during the COVID, um, COVID time period. You know, you took his case um, after after he was diagnosed in, in um, Moorfields, but they they were not able to help him at that time, and we we was referred to you, and you did a private uh, surgery. You did surgery for my son. Uh, my question really here is that we as as mother and son, and my son struggling with his mouth fans as well. We really get sometimes um, shifted to, to go to opticians and it's really hard to keep up with hospital appointments. And sometimes, you know, with more fields as well, there's such usually a waiting list. And since the COVID and, and with everything being online, it's become a lot more difficult and challenging to speak to the doctors directly and get the um, right medical advice um, and how to look after um, have to how to maintain yourself, how to regularly re get checked up because when my son goes, for example, they just give him very basic generic advice and they don't really, or they're so overwhelmed by his complex condition that they don't know what to do with him. And so, so often we, me and my son, we feel quite isolated that we don't know how to deal with his circumstances. And now that you mentioned that there's a possibility that he may have to have another eye surgery how do we how do we like who can we contact so that to make sure that he has the right team to be able to look after his eyes properly thank you Mariam thank you for that question and I think it's um it's not an uncommon situation that you find yourself in um <clears throat> I mean ultimately he will need his eyes checked regularly and if you in the easiest method is at least to find a consistent optometrist who can at least assess if there's any visual change. Um, 
finding a, a team who's particularly interested in Marfan syndrome, th there isn't really any particular um, team in most places of people that are particularly interested in Marfan syndrome from an ophthalmic point of view. Um, but from from your point of view and from your son's point of view, you, I, can't, I, don't, I can't remember, I'm sorry, has he had both eyes operated or just one? Just one on the left eye. His name that, was, that, that was a lens, was it? Yes, his name was Yusuf Akun. I wonder if um, you remember it. Um, so I think, you know, the, the the eye needs to be assessed moderately regularly for two reasons, just to check that the eye that's been operated on, that the pressure in the eye is is okay. And again, an optometrist can do this um, and, the, and checking whether the other lens has begun to move. Well, the reason I say a consistent optometrist, because if you go to different optometrists all the time, they're going to be overwhelmed each time they meet you because it's a, a rare condition for them to deal with. Whereas if you go to the same individual or at least try to go to the same individual, they will then develop their own um, consistent features of his and your eyes. Um, so I can't recommend anyone in particular. I don't know where you live, but I think ultimately a, a, an optometrist will be easier for you to attend to. And Morfields, as you say, can be very busy and overwhelming. Um, but I can't give any spe more specific advice, but I think ultimately a consistent optometrist individual would, would make it easier to notice any change in, in his eyes or your eyes. Thank you. Andre has the hand up. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I have, a, I have a, only only one question. Uh, it's uh, it's more about my, my daughter. She's one, one year old. Uh, we didn't identify anything uh, wrong with her eyes uh, except some anisocoria. That is, is uh, ph physiological, the, they said. What I wanted to ask uh, is uh, if during your research, did you identify something, uh, some exon specific that can give problems uh, in, in the eyes? Um, thanks, Andre. So uh, we, we've known for a long time that mutations that result in um, abnormalities of the cysteine residue um, are more prone to cause um, ocular problems. Um, and exons within the within the middle of the of the of the fibrin one are more prone. But you know, Jose may be able to um, update, update us on that. But essentially, mutations can occur anywhere. But the, those that result in problems of the cysteine residue are more prone to result in um, ectopia lentis, which is the main thing we looked at. Um, but with regard to your daughter, you know, as long as you check getting her, eye, her vision checked regularly, um, that's the most important thing. Yes, we we just did uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, nothing nothing was a uh, nothing in particular was found. Uh, I also have Marvan. Uh, I was uh, I tested myself uh, after she was born uh, as a follow up to identify where the the mission came from. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, but I have, uh, other than some small physiological changes, uh, uh, the arch is a, li a little higher and the uh, blood fuss and so on. Uh, I don't have anything regarding the eye or the heart or whatever. How, how is your daughter diagnosed? Uh, amniocentesis. Why? What, if you found, did you have a history in your family? Uh, no, we had another uh, another Pregnancy. pregnancy with uh, okay. yes with, with another mutation that uh, and, and the other one had to be tested uh, in advance with amniocentesis. It doesn't. I think um, Roman would be interested in your family, wouldn't uh, to, to, to... Yes, I, I I already contacted him. <laughs> um, Alex Mayers asked a question: Do sutures have a limited lifespan in an operation uh, to replace the lens? Yeah. There could be a 15 minute, 15 year limit, meaning individuals may need multiple operations in their lifetime. Is that correct? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, so with the original surgeries that were, uh, so the original sutures that have been published many years ago do um, have suggested that some of them may break over, over 10 to 15, well, five to 15 years. Um, and so there, there may well be um, a life, um, a lifespan to them. Um, I don't know if that's the correct phrase. Uh, a limited time to them. But the sutures that we I tend to use now are called Gore-Tex, and they are used in cardiac surgery, <clears throat> and they 
you know, they have a, a seemingly in cardiac surgery, a very long lifespan. So one would hope they would have a similar um, lifespan within the eye. However, there are other lenses that we can use now, which are, don't rely on sutures and they are fixed. In, that's I've been using those the last few years and they are fixed into the white of the eye without the need for stitches. Um, and the long, we haven't got long-term data, but the data we have over the last five years now, it suggests that they're, they, 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 they should stay. They're designed specifically to fit in to the white part of the eye without, without the capsule. Um, and as long as the, and so I'm beginning to use those more frequently in Marfan. Terry asked if ectopia lentis was prevalent in lower steet syndrome. Hmm. Um, and not as far as I, it's not as, not as far as I know, um, but perhaps um, Anne or Jose may have a better answer to that. I've not knowingly seen anyone with, with lower steet syndrome with it, with ectopia lentis. Jose? Anne? I just want to say that uh, in the literature, they only say that it's not really common on the LDS, but there have been patients that um, have been, um, associated with that yeah so i think val's got a question uh, <clears throat> yes hello um i seem to have been clever enough to pass marfan on to uh my family um and <clears throat> i have um, um three 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 sons and um five grandchildren three of whom have uh have marfan um, at the moment, the, the, there is a 10-year-old <clears throat> and an 11-year-old in the same family, both with Marfan. Uh, <clears throat> both lenses are um, slipping. Um, and the 10-year-old, it's been suggested that surgery is going to be needed so sooner rather than later. Um, but my son, having read um, your very excellent um, leaflet, and, and so many details and questions it answered for him. But he's in the quandary now of um, uh, whether or not to, to agree to surgery, if that is what the suggestion is going to be, which it looks likely, um, or whether um, it's it's too young to be removing it at this, this stage. There are pros and cons, uh, as you explained, on keeping the lens there um, until later teens perhaps and, and afterwards um, but if it gets so bad that it needs to be re removed when uh, at, at, at 10 years old uh, that is a lot of years ahead and there are things ahead that could happen because of having that surgery early as you explain um, so it's it I wondered what sort of um, criteria you looked at to to decide which method is would be good? I realise it would be the individual case, of course, but um, was there something you you would look for or go by as to whether it was good at this stage or not so good? I think that's how I can phrase. Yeah, it. I, I can. I say you, you posed that question very well, and um, uh, and I think the answer to that, of course, I can't comment on that individual case. Surgery in young in children is not as straightforward as adults, so one tries to um, postpone it as long as possible. But if the lens is so, when the lens moves, if your if your lens is meant to be there in front of my face and it moves a bit, that can be more disturbing to the vision than if it's moved completely. If it's moved completely out the way, then it doesn't cause interference, and you can put a contact lens on the eye to to help them see. But for me, first of all, you, you look to see if it's, it's doing that and therefore affecting the vision. And if it is doing so, that can affect the, the development of the visual pathways in the child, particularly under the age of eight. Secondly, if there's signs of progression. So if, you've, if, you, if, he's, been, if he's been examined and it's there, then over the next time it's there, that there's signs that it's getting worse. Um, and that may, may um, so progression, that may um, point us towards surgical intervention, particularly if it's not moving slow, quick enough, but it's moving quick enough for it to be a problem. And as I said, if the lens is sort of tends to be there rather than there, that can be a more visually significant in terms of development of vision. I mean, it happened to me. I, ha I have been through it myself. Um, so I know what it's like to have a, a you know, double vision in, mm. in effect. Um, and of course, in the uh, what are we talking about? Uh, I'm in the 80s now, so uh, a long time ago. Um, they told me at the time that it was quite safe to let it sit in the bottom. Yeah. It dislocated completely and was sitting at the bottom. So I managed with, 
with contact lenses. But in fact, of course, that turned cataractus and, and it had to be removed. It leaked into the um, into the eye and um, my pressures went up to 70. So uh, it's not a good thing. I think they've learned now, have they not, um, that, that it's not uh, not a good thing to leave it sitting there. Um, it, it's which stage, you know, you decide to remove it. And presumably it depends on what the child is seeing or not seeing, doesn't it? That's true. So a young child, their lens is, on, is not going to be cataractus very quickly. So if it dropped, you can leave it there for a period of time. <clears throat> because as I say, surgery to remove it isn't all that straightforward. So you've got to balance up the risks and benefits. Mm -hmm. um, most lenses we can leave in the back of the eye, but if they are becoming more cataractus, and can happen like has happened to you, that can that would obviously be a problem as well. But dare I say it, removing the lens from someone of your age is more straightforward because of the nature of the eye than a child. So there's a balance between the risks of surgery and the risks of leaving a lens that's not cataractus in the back of the eye. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, it, it does depend. I mean, at the moment he's he's managing, but everything is coming right up to his face to read. Mm. Um, and of course, his sister, uh, who is the year older, will face the same situation a few years ahead. But they're saying that that could last a little bit longer. Okay. In her case. So it's getting it right, you know, for one, and you want to get it right for the other one, don't you? But his dad too. I mean, you know, their father has um, also got major problems at the moment. Where, whereas he he's sort of fifty fifty one. Um, and um, again, he has to decide on, uh, you know, a lot of surgery for himself. So anyway, it's a long story in my family. But um, thank you very much. It's very it's it's good to hear another uh, to your view, particularly on that. Thank you. I think there was another hand up, Victoria, was there? Or was there a um, question? Rachel's written to ask, she has ectopia lentist and she's always having her eye pressures done and she doesn't know why this is. This is Okay, yes, we, we check eye pressures on, on almost any patient that comes to the eye clinic as part of the routine, not just in patients with Marfan syndrome, but anyone. Um, but there is a potential risk for the lens or any other con uh, aspect of Marfan syndrome causing the pressure to go up. So it's not that you have glaucoma, but it needs to be the pressure needs to be monitored. And another patient's written to say that he has glaucoma and it's not being particularly well controlled by drops. There's now damage to the optic nerve. This is very specific and it's an individual. Yeah. So I don't know if you can comment on that. Well, there are, you know, so if drops are not working, there's, ch ch there's signs of progression of the disease, then something more definitive needs to be undertaken. And there are options such as laser therapy or surgery to the eye. Um, both of those techniques are well established and used in in any patient with glaucoma um, and there isn't any specific data to tell us which is better in patients with marfan um, than the normal population okay thank you um any further questions for mr chandra there's a comment here from Amanda saying she had a lens replaced with haptics, which lasted two weeks before it burst through the sclera. I'm, I'm sorry to hear about that. And um, <clears throat> I don't, you know, I, yeah, I can't, I can't really comment on that. Um, but one hopes that that wouldn't uh, happen in most cases. Thank you so much, Aman. Thanks, Victoria. I may email you with further questions. I'll email you with that PDF of that sort of, Yes, please. I can share it with everybody here. Thank you.